Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Hi, I'm Roland Fernandez from Microsoft Research. It's my great pleasure to introduce uh, Kate Posing from UCSF Memory and Aging Center. She's going to talk to us about her current work. Thank you, Roland, and thank you for having me here. It's been a real honor to, first of all, just get to collaborate with your group on some research and navigation. And it's an honor, too, to be able to come here and see what you all do firsthand. So thank you very much for having me. I'm, I'm used to giving talks to neuroscientists, so um, I please feel free to ask me questions if, if what I'm saying is not clear, if I'm making assumptions about things that um, you may already know or, or you don't know. So I'm going to be talking about visual spatial cognition and neurodegenerative diseases today. And this is an area that I've been working on with Roland and Desney. We've been developing some new virtual reality tests of navigation. I come from the Memory and Aging Center at UCSF, where we do provide a lot of clinical care, but we're very much involved in research. And we're trying to develop better methods to diagnose neurodegenerative diseases, like Alzheimer's disease. And we want to find uh, ways to diagnose them in their earliest stages so that as treatments become available, we'll be able to help patients as early as possible. We also need measures that can track progression of disease so that we can measure whether or not these new treatments are working. We are also, a lot of people in our group, working on finding the actual cures for these diseases. So our research is twofold. I'm more involved with the first aim in developing these methods for diagnosis and measuring progression. I'm going to start out by giving some background on how to test visual spatial cognition by thinking about anatomy. And then I'm going to talk about how I think visual cognition is organized in the brain according to three primary schemes, dorsal and ventral, top down and bottom up, and lastly, egocentric and allocentric, which is the focus of the work I've been doing with Microsoft. And lastly, I'm going to think about with you how visual spatial cognition is disrupted in different neurodegenerative diseases. And I've decided to focus on the three most common kind of neurodegenerative diseases. So Alzheimer's disease being the most common, and then Parkinson's disease, which in 80% of cases is associated with dementia before death, and frontotemporal lobar degeneration, which you may not have heard of. It's, uh, people are really only beginning to understand that disorder in the last 10 years or so. It's a, earlier onset kind of dementia typically hits people in their 50s or 60s. <clears throat> when a neuropsychologist like myself does an evaluation to see if someone might have a neurodegenerative disease, I focus on four primary areas of cognition. Memory, language, executive functioning, and visual spatial skills. I think this last domain is perhaps the, the least well studied and evaluated in dementia evaluations. And perhaps that's because it's hard to measure with paper and pencil tests. It's hard, for example, to figure out if someone can navigate through a new environment by asking them to copy a figure on a piece of paper. Now, with technology that you know, your group is working on here, we have the ability to test visual spatial skills in an ecologically valid way by immersing patients in a new uh, a new world and seeing how well they can navigate through it. So I think these new advances in technology are offering a, a potential pathway down which neuropsychologists can do a much better job of evaluating visual spatial skills. <clears throat> well, why do we evaluate all this cognition? The reason is, is that the types of cognitive problems that a person has depends on the, where the pathology is in the brain. For example, if you have damage to your hippocampus and your medial temporal lobe, you're going to have trouble with memory because that part of the brain is essential for laying down new memories. Alzheimer's patients, this is the first area of the brain that is hit. And that's why Alzheimer's patients typically have memory loss as their first symptom. 
by examining the pattern of cognitive strengths and weaknesses that a patient has, I can get a sense of which parts of their brain are working and which parts of their brain are not working. This is important because different diseases have characteristic ways that they impact the brain. So Alzheimer's tends to start in the hippocampus and surrounding areas and then move into temporal and parietal cortex. Whereas frontotemporal dementia tends to start in the front part of the brain, the frontal lobes. And the back part of the brain is pretty well preserved. So these different diseases have their own signatures of how they start and how they progress. A good test, therefore, is going to be specific to the anatomic and cognitive mechanisms of the diseases that you're studying. So a good test needs to be anatomically specific. If a patient can fail a test because of damage to the front of their brain or their back of the brain, that's not going to help us distinguish between Alzheimer's and frontotemporal dementia. So just as an example of these patterns of pathology, this is a study of the atrophy, where the atrophy is in the average Alzheimer's patient um, on the left here compared to controls, and then frontotemporal lobar degeneration. So in Alzheimer's disease, you see there's this damage in the back of the brain that's getting atrophied. The front is relatively well preserved. You can't see that medial temporal lobe hippocampal area here, but it's inside here. And then frontotemporal dementia has more problems in the front of the brain, collapsed across many subjects. So a good test to distinguish between these diseases would separately measure the functioning of those frontal or posterior brain regions. As I mentioned, visual spatial cognition is in the dark ages in terms of how we're assessing it these days in clinic. Pretty much everyone who assesses visual spatial cognition in a dementia evaluation is going to show a patient a figure like this one and ask them to copy it. However, a patient can fail this for many different reasons. Perhaps they have trouble simply perceiving aspects of the figure. Perhaps they can't organize it in their mind or come up with a good plan for how to go about copying it. Or maybe they have motor dysfunction. So I, there's a study I'm writing up right now where I examine the performance of patients on this test. And the patients either have a diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease or frontotemporal dementia. So those diseases I just showed you in the last, um, the last slide. So both patients have trouble with this test, but for different anatomical reason, reasons. So in Alzheimer's disease, having trouble on this test was associated with atrophy in the right parietal lobe. That's right here. That's the part of the brain we traditionally think of when we think about visual spatial processing. Uh, where they, the right frontal lobe, however, was not involved with performance in these patients. We see a different path. Yeah, please nature of the atrophy, when you say atrophy, is it neuron death or is it sort of like water atrophy or I mean, yeah. is it well understood? Well, uh, we operationalize it here by just there being less gray matter in the brain. So we assume that means that there has been cell death that has led to decreased volume in that brain area. So you could say that it's less activity, right, when you measure the images? Well, here we're not measuring activity per se, but we might if we were doing functional MRI, and, um, and which is, I, I think, also a really interesting way to look at this. In the behavioral variant FTD patients who have that atrophy in the front of their brain, they are failing it for two different reasons, really. Yes, parietal lobe still correlates. Right parietal lobe is just such a critical visual spatial reason region, but they also can fail it because they're having atrophy in their right frontal lobe. So there's this, these different neural mechanisms underlying their difficulties on this test. Yes, please. Are you using right as an example or is it really that asymmetric? That's a great question. Visual spatial processing is processed much more by the right side of our brain than the left. Language, on the other hand, is on the left side of the brain, which is why we're focusing on the right here. These patients show degeneration on the left side also, but it's more severe and more consequential on the right? In terms of visual spatial skills, if I was looking at the correlates of performance on a language test, we would see the left side of the brain playing a bigger role. <laughs>
But yeah, the diseases usually tend to start for an individual patient on one side or the other and then spread to both sides. Also looked in the same sample at the cognitive mechanisms, just correlating performance on that figure copy with performance on other tests. So spatial perception, just being able to perceive where locations are in space, was highly associated in Alzheimer's disease patients with performance on that test, but was not associated in the FDD patients. Instead, for them, performance was associated with performance on a test of spatial planning or problem solving, these sort of executive higher order aspects of spatial cognition that the front part of the brain is so important for. So in conclusion, this test of figure copy, which is how pretty much everybody assesses visual spatial cognition right now as a neuropsychologist, can be failed for different reasons and is not very useful for separating these two common causes of dementia. Yes? If they're failing at spatial perception, are they having motor control issues too or proprioceptive problems? I mean, when you see damage in the motor cortex as well? That's a good question. I guess it depends on where the perceptual problems are coming from. But, you know, if you're having uh, perceptual problems because of parietal atrophy, your motor functioning might be fine. You might have trouble, you know, um, if I'm trying to reach for this bottle, I might kind of miss it. But their motor function isn't, isn't too bad. If it's coming from more of a subcortical origin, then the motor system is often impacted. Like though eventually, that would cause problems because you'd be mismapping it. If it's severe enough, absolutely. These patients have a lot of trouble getting through the, the environment. Absolutely. So we finished the first part, the background of the talk, and now I'm going to move into how is visual cognition processed by the brain using these three schemes. Bef a little background, so visual information enters the brain through the, through the eye and um, travels through axons of ganglion cells to this optic chiasm. So visual information on the right side of your visual world, but seen by both eyes, is going to actually go to the left side of your brain. And information on the left side of your visual world is all going to go to the right side of your brain. So that, that cross happens here. And then the information goes through the thalamus and through all these axons to primary visual cortex in the back of your brain. So that's where all the visual information goes first in cortex. If you have a lesion anywhere in that system, you're going to have a blind spot. There's going to be part of your visual field that's completely missing. As the information leaves primary visual cortex, more complex aspects of the visual world are processed and separated. So there are regions that are important for processing motion and color and form. Um, and depth, so these are all processed by different areas. So if you have a lesion in any of those areas, you're, gonna, you're not going to have a blind spot, but you're going to be impaired at processing some aspect of the visual world. So information moves uh, anteriorly through the brain in these dorsal and ventral streams. The dorsal stream is also called the wear stream. It processes where things are in space, and this goes through the parietal lobe. It's also been called the how stream because we encode the locations of objects based on how we would act on them. For example, I'm encoding where this bottle is, maybe about, uh, in terms of how I would reach out and grab it. So this is, is very tied with the motor system, which is the point that you made. The ventral stream here goes through temporal cortex. This is the what stream. It processes the features of objects that are relevant to their identity, like color and form. <clears throat> so it's interesting that these are separated, the what and the where. But if you think about it in the real world, what this bottle looks like has nothing to do with where it's sitting. And if I move it over here, it still looks like the same bottle. So our brains represent this functional real world distinction, I think. So I think this is an important scheme, and we definitely see patients in clinic all the time that have damage more to the dorsal wear stream or to the ventral wet stream. I'll show you some examples of how we test 
these, uh, these constructs. So this is a test of dorsal stream processing. This is, you have to say which number up here is in the same position as this dot. So which number is it? Seven. Seven. All right. You guys pass. Good. It's a really easy test for controls. And this is a test of object recognition. So you have to say which one is a silhouette of a real object. I kind of chose a, a pretty easy example. I think you guys can all see that that's a, a stroller. The next, next extinction I'm going to talk about is top-down and bottom-up processing. Progressively more complex aspects of the visual world are processed as representations move from the back of the brain forward. Top-down processing, on the other hand, is uh, conducted by the front part of your brain, your frontal lobes, and these circuits that connect the frontal lobes to subcortical regions. So this anterior brain um, <coughs> selects representations in posterior cortex that are in need of further processing. Like, I want to pay more attention to that object in the environment. Also helps you manipulate those representations in your mind, inhibit irrelevant information, maintain those representations in your very short-term memory after the stimuli are no longer available in your environment. So these executive aspects of visual processing. So this distinction, as you can imagine, is important for the diseases I just mentioned. Often, frontotemporal dementia patients have more trouble with the top down and Alzheimer's more with the bottom up, for example. The last distinction is that of egocentric and allocentric frames of reference. In the egocentric system, we're representing the locations of objects in the environment relative to our own position. And we continuously update that information as we move through the environment. So this is important both in very short-term representations, like your working memory. If you're moving through a crowded room and trying to find a place to sit down, you're encoding where all these objects and people are relative to yourself and continuously updating them to guide your movement. So this system is very tied with the motor system. The caudate nucleus, which is a subcortical structure in the brain, deep in the gray matter of your brain in the basal ganglia, that brain region has been shown to really anchor this egocentric network in rodents, and I think also in humans. Parietal cortex is also critical for this egocentric frame of reference. This, uh, this system is important also for habit or routine learning. So when you've taken the same route so many times that it just becomes a routine, you're using the system. You don't even feel like you have to think about it anymore. You take the same route every day to work. Maybe one time you're planning to go to the store instead, but you forget to turn off to go to the store because you're so used to going to work every day. That's that. That's the egocentric system. The allocentric system, on the other hand, represents the locations of objects in the environment, particularly boundary cues and major landmarks, relative to each other. And they form a cognitive map, if you will. For example, um, let's say you wanted to go to the store after work. You've never been to that store from work before. You've only been there from home. And you know the store is west of, of home, um, and home is north of work, so then you know you need to go northwest to get to the store. But you've created this 3D representation of where these landmarks are for you, and you can manipulate yourself in those landmarks. This, so this is important for developing these cognitive maps of the environment that are independent of your own position in the environment. If someone plopped you down in Seattle in some other place, like you'd be able to figure out where you were relative to some major buildings or the direction of the sun, and you could probably get a general sense of which way you needed to go home. Taxi drivers use the system all the time. They can't take the same route all the time. They have to continuously find uh, the, the most efficient route to get somewhere maybe that they have never been to before from that place. So they're using these cognitive maps more than probably anyone else. And there was some really interesting research out of London that showed that taxi drivers indeed have larger hippocampi, so that's the structure in the brain that's really anchoring this system, and in fact years of experience as a taxi driver was correlated with bigger hippocampi. Some people have suggested 
perhaps, that if we practice using this system, we can make our hippocampi more robust to the effects of aging and Alzheimer's disease, where the disease first starts. So I'm working on it. My Allison, actually, women tend not to be as good at using the system as men, um, but I'm hoping practice will help. So. How do you practice? <laughs> How do you practice? Yeah. Well, for, don't use MathQuest all the time. Yeah, instead, you know, maybe study a map and try to get a sense of where things are relative to each other. I also heard that playing soccer helps. Playing, how, how come? Just heard from a, from a colleague. <laughs> as long as you don't get hit in the head, I think it helps. <laughs> I'm going to start blindfolding my kids and dumping them in random locations. <laughs> The reason we know so much about these egocentric and allocentric frames of reference is that they've been studied extensively in rodents. When you want to measure rodent cognition, what people do is they measure forms of navigation. This is the most popular test of navigation in the rodent. It's the Morris water maze. The rodent is plopped down in this cold pool of milky water that has a hidden platform. And they swim around desperately trying to find a way to get out until they find the platform. And then the rodent is placed back in the pool from a different starting position. The rodent then swims around again trying to find the platform. So this is repeated over and over again. The rodent gets better at finding the platform. And by manipulating things like the types of cues available, you can test different forms of navigation. For example, if you have the rodent start from a different starting place on every trial, they can't just memorize a route to get to the platform. Instead, they have to memorize the relationship of the platform to the boundary cues, for example, the things around the pool, maybe it's the door and the computer and the things that are in your laboratory around. So he learns, he creates a map of the platform relative to those cues, and he can use that to find the hidden platform. In another version of the test, they rotate the pool on every trial, so those cues on the outside aren't helpful, and they start the rodent from the same position in the pool relative to the platform, and so then they just learn the route over and over again. So you can see the first one I described tests more of the allocentric, cognitive map building, hippocampal dependent kind of navigation, and the latter one was testing that caudate nucleus dependent um, route learning egocentric form. So when we're trying to find cures for neurodegenerative diseases, we test them in rodent models of dementia first. So the idea of having a navigation test that was analogous to the ways that we're measuring cognition in rodents for our, our human patients is very exciting. Because if we see that a drug for Mouseheimer's, which is the mouse version of Alzheimer's, works because the rodents are doing better on the Morris water maze, well, why don't we have a human version of the Morris water maze to see if it, the drug works in humans? So it's nice to be able to translate these findings back and forth. I want to briefly present this study. This is a virtual navigation study that was done in, um, in young adults, young healthy adults. And this is a radial maze. So there are eight of these... Um, paths that someone could take off the center, and in half of them there is a treasure that they have to find. The first time they go through, the ones without a treasure are blocked, and they're just supposed to remember which ones do have the treasure. And then the next time they go through, they, um, they go and look for the treasure. The treasures are like, down at the end, and they're kind of hidden. So the subjects have to learn which, of the f which four of the eight arms have the treasure. Well, there are these mountains or sunset, depending on which way you're looking, and you can use those boundary landmark cues to help you. Or you can kind of remember that, um, oh yeah, there's two next to each other, and then I keep going, I, I pass one, and I get to another one. More of a route um, uh, form of, of finding the treasure. So there's two different strategies which are arguably more of an allocentric and then an egocentric strategy. You could use either one. So what the, the uh, researchers did was they, um, after they performed the test, the subjects performed the test, they removed these boundary cues, so it went black, and then saw how the people did. And the idea was the people who hadn't built that cognitive map, they didn't use those external cues, they were still going to do fine. But the people who had been relying on them, they had built a cognitive map, we're now going to fail. And then they correlated the number of errors with uh, gray matter 
in the brain. And they showed that the people who um, made a lot of errors actually had bigger hippocampi. So that suggests, which is the area for building cognitive maps. So they argued that, well, these people were building cognitive maps. They weren't using the other strategy. And so that's why they then failed when we took away the boundary cues. In contrast, the people who um, made fewer errors on the probe had a bigger caudate nucleus. So that's the structure that's important for that route learning egocentric. And they were able to do, they were using that strategy, and so they um, made fewer errors at the probe. So that's one of the virtual reality tests that has been used out there. Um, and I've been working on some other ones I'll show you shortly uh, with Roland. So we went over those schemes of visual spatial cognition. So just to review, dorsal ventral is um, where processing versus what processing. There's that top-down, bottom-up distinction depending on top-down executive control and, and bottom-up early visual processing. And then we just talked about the egocentric, allocentric distinction. I think these schemes can be helpful for us to understand how visual spatial cognition is disrupted in neurodegenerative diseases. I want to start with Alzheimer's, which is, of course, the most common cause of neurodegenerative disease. And actually, before I do, I, I'm realizing I should back up a little bit um, and, and tell you um, why are there different neurodegenerative diseases. Well, each of these diseases is associated with aggregations of a different type of protein in the brain. So if we cut open a patient's brain who has Alzheimer's, we're going to see these amyloid plaques, and we're going to see these neurofibrillary tangles in their brain. So these signature types of pathology that we think are probably causing the disease. If we open up someone's brain with Parkinson's disease, we're going to see aggregations of alpha-synuclein protein. So these are different diseases as a, at a pathological level. And the reason that we need to be good at diagnosing these diseases is because the treatments for each of these diseases are going to be different. The treatments that we're evaluating right now are designed to target and clear or prevent the buildup of these abnormal proteins. So Alzheimer's disease. These patients have quite a bit of visual spatial dysfunction. This is a patient with a mild level of dementia. There's a global test of cognition that most doctors use called the mini mental state exam. This patient had a score of 20 on that test. And you can see that there's some um, you know, dis spatial distortions and misplacements in this figure. So these patients have diffusely decreased cortical gray matter, most uh, really prominent in this posterior temporal and parietal regions. So I showed you the dorsal ventral streams. These patients have trouble with both the dorsal and the ventral stream. They typically have more trouble with this bottom-up processing, whereas the top-down executive aspects, in most cases, are relatively spared. Certainly, there, there's a lot of variability, however. In some patients, they have a more frontal presentation. In this study, patients who were diagnosed with mild cognitive impairment who were thought to have a very, very early form of Alzheimer's disease were followed. And the patients who went on to develop Alzheimer's disease a year later, this is, what their, this is where they had atrophy in their brain. It was located just in this medial temporal lobe region. That's where the hippocampus is. So in these patients who didn't have Alzheimer's yet but were about to get it, their atrophy was circumscribed to this region. At the time of diagnosis a year later, we see quite a bit more atrophy, all those red areas involving the temporal and parietal cortex and a little bit in frontal cortex, so a bit more diffuse, but still following a characteristic pattern. So this clearly tells us if we want to identify patients in the early stages, we need tests that are going to, are going to really measure the functioning of that region. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Slides. It looks like the atrophy is lateralized as well towards the right region. Is that true? Or is that just a characteristic of the two slides? Well, and it also sometimes it depends on just your sample. I don't. I can't say that Alzheimer's more often affects the right or the left side. It, sometimes it, you see these differences in these studies. Um, so let's see. He, 
there, there do seem, like here it seems to be a little bit more on the left than the right there. Um, over here, sorry? The, the previous one looked more on the right, but it, that was my Oh, point. yeah. I think it's just a function of your, your sample and some variability. I don't think people generally think that this disease, on average, starts on one side or the other. Other diseases, that's not always true. So anyhow, if you want to catch patients early with Alzheimer's, you want to test the functioning of the medial temporal lobe, the hippocampus. And because of that, I think allocentric uh, navigation might be a really good way to get at this. After all, in the rodent models of navigation, we know that the hippocampus anchors that allocentric network. So I'm thinking one thing that we're going to test out with the tests that we're developing is seeing if early Alzheimer's patients are selectively impaired at allocentric navigation. And this is um, a version of the task, one of the tasks that Roland and I have been working on that we think will measure allocentric navigation. In this test, the patient is placed in a, this circular field. They're not placed in a cold, milky pool like the rodents, but in a circular field. And they look around to try to find a treasure. And because they start from a different position on every trial, they have to find the treasure relative to the cues in the environment, those external boundary cues just like the rat had to find the hidden platform relative to the cues in the lab surrounding the pool. And we've actually just been working on this test this afternoon and Roland's hooked it up with this driving simulator which makes getting around in the environment really fun and we've been making the boundary cues quite a bit richer. And we'd love if anyone wanted to stop by and try it out. The treasure only appears when you get within a certain radius of it, is that right? Yeah. Sorry, maybe you can go into some more detail, but the metric is time. Well, we, actually, that's something that we'll probably be working out today and tomorrow, but some of the things we've thought about are, are time, but also um, how much ground is covered, because I think some people might move faster, how much time is spent in the quadrant where the treasure is located, like do they, are they just randomly looking all over, or are they focusing their search? Those are some of the metrics that are used with the rodents. Is your goal to come up with a robust quantitative metric, or... So the scenarios you talked about still had a therapist in the loop. Is it, it or is largely the goal to present a task that just allows you to observe a different set of skills in the drawing task where you just, if you were looking at the screen, you would get at least a good sense of what somebody was up to mm -hmm. as a quantitative metric could produce. Is your goal that sort of therapist in the loop scenario or to really produce a robust quantitative estimation of what their skills are at? I definitely would like the latter, even if I was just working as a clinician. I want a robust quantitative metric. And for example, if 10 years from now, this is a clinical measure, maybe five, um, if this was a clinical measure, I want to be able to compare my patient's performance to normative data. So if, if I was going to validate this for clinical purposes, I'd probably run this on 1,000 controls, and then I could compare my patient's performance to how does a typical healthy person do. So we definitely need you know, the those quantitative wouldn't measures. necessarily be supervised in every case. You wouldn't be staring at them and doing qualitative evaluation of their strategies. Yeah, not necessarily. Um, I, it would be great. I mean, I think that's one of the advantages of these virtual techniques is perhaps the having the examiner there as opposed to maybe just an assistant running the test is less important. So as something that we were talking about earlier today, um, this kind of having virtual tests of cognition maybe can help neuropsychology reach into areas where neuropsychologists are not available. Like many um, more rural places in the United States, for example, there are no neuropsychologists. Maybe we can come up with a, looking down the road, a packaged virtual system for evaluating <coughs> cognition and be able to help and diagnose more people. We're going to move on to the second of the three diseases now, Parkinson's disease. Parkinson's disease starts in these areas in black, the brain stem and the olfactory tract, and moves up the brain stem. It's not until stage three of the disease that the midbrain is hit right here. And this part of the brain has the substantia nigra, which sends dopamine to the basal ganglia including the caudate nucleus, which I've been talking about quite a bit today. 
The dopamine depletion in the basal ganglia is very severe. In fact, you need at least 80% depletion before you start showing any Parkinsonian symptoms. This loss of dopamine is thought to cause the motor symptoms of Parkinson's disease, and also in the early state, the early aspects of cognitive impairment. So patients with Parkinson's disease do show subtle but meaningful impairments in cognition that affect aspects of spatial and executive functioning. And this is because the caudate nucleus is highly interconnected with the frontal and parietal lobes, and these loops are important for these aspects of cognition. Losing the dopamine um, hurts cognition because the dopamine is important for regulating the functioning of those circuits. So um, in some, you know, as the pathology moves up here to the midbrain, the patients are going to start to show uh, cognitive problems due to basal ganglia dysfunction as well as motor dysfunction. And this is the pathology that we're talking about. We see these aggregations of alpha synuclein protein called Lewy bodies. This is an image of some of these subcortical structures I've been talking about. This is the caudate nucleus here, this rounded structure. And this is the putamen in here. The putamen is very important for motor function. The caudate is more important for cognitive function and important for that egocentric navigation that we've been talking about. Now, so these, this, these are the projections for the substantia nigra. So these projections are lost in Parkinson's disease, and so you don't get as much dopamine there. And so the circuits that connect these structures with the frontal lobes in particular are impacted. So that gives you a sense of why we see problems in Parkinson's disease. As the disease progresses, more pathology moves into cortex. Parkinson's patients have a lot more trouble with spatial information, location-based information, than they do with object-based or verbal information. This is an example of a working memory test, so very short-term memory. In one condition of the test, the patients are told to pay attention to where these objects are located on the computer screen. After a very brief delay, another object appears, and the subject has to say, is that object in the same place as one of the two that you just saw or not? So they're just maintaining spatial-based or location-based information. A couple hours later, they're given the test again, but this time they just have to pay attention to what the objects look like, ignoring where they're located in space. Is this the same as either of the ones you just saw? Well, the Parkinson's patients have a select deficit in maintaining the spatial-based information, that location-based information. And it emerges at a very short delay, at a one-second delay, and doesn't worsen with increasing delays. So they have a select problem with aspects of spatial attention and the earliest parts of working memory. We always think of Parkinson's as a motor output disorder or disease. More cognitive symptoms actually uh, appear around the same time as motor, motor representations? Yeah, I mean, that's a great question. I mean, Parkinson's is historically thought of as really a pure motor disorder, but now we're really understanding that that's not the case. Now, these patients are in the early stages, stages of Parkinson's disease. They're not demented. Many of them drive themselves to the appointment. In fact, probably most of them were able to. Many of them are still working if they're of that age. So these are non-demented patients with Parkinson's disease. So these are very circumscribed um, impairments. Now, some people um, would argue that in many patients, the cognitive impairments actually can even precede the motor symptoms. It definitely happens in some cases. We actually call that disease dementia with Lewy bodies when the cognitive impairment appears first. These patients have some observable... These, have mo these patients definitely, they were diagnosed with Parkinson's dis motor disease. But this is early. These are non-demented patients. As you may have been picking up through my talk, one thing that uh, Roland and Desney and I have been very interested in is this distinction between allocentric and egocentric uh, um, navigation and these different brain regions that mediate them because in Alzheimer's disease they have this early problem with the medial temporal lobe including the hippocampus and Parkinson's have early trouble with the dorsal caudate which is important for egocentric navigation. So um, we're excited about testing out these navigation strategies in these patients because we think we're going to see a real different pattern of deficits.
This is an example of our egocentric route learning test. On this test, the subjects learned a set route through an environment by trial and error. So the first time they go through, they're just guessing. But as they go through the environment several times, we'll give them up to 10 trials. Over time, they're going to get better. They're going to learn the routine of going through the environment. There's no useful boundary cues like in that other task that I showed you. And really, we're finding in pilot testing that even our normal subjects are not building a cognitive map of the environment. Instead, they're relying more on the relationship between local cues, like turn right at the red building, and also just a motor or routine kind of memory, sort of the sequence of key presses or maybe driving simulator movements if we hook it up to the driving simulator. So we think that this test is going to test that egocentric system that's uh, subserved by the caudate nucleus and will be more impaired in Parkinson's disease than in Alzheimer's disease. Would you still consider it a, a motor or a, a spatial task if, if it's possible to have a strategy where you're basically memorizing a sequence of characters? It's a real tricky thing to design because the, the, uh, discovering the route is pretty spatial. But okay. if I can really get to the point where it's like LR, mm -hmm. R, L, 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 R, it sort of ceases to become a spatial task then? I, you know, I think you're making an excellent point, and I think that there's a transition that happens when people are doing the test. I think at first they're remembering turn right at the red building, but as they go through the test, it becomes more of a motor memory, a routine. Or even a, a sort of, uh, verbal isn't the right word, but a truly mm -hmm. semantic memory, like I remember like LR, like I would never remember what it's words. You could even use a verbalizable strategy to do this, or you could just sort of remember the movements. You, Absolutely. I don't have any suggestions. It seems like a really hard problem to separate it, those things. It is, apart. and that's something that we've thought a lot about. Um, and we're, we think, we're thinking about ways to maybe tease that apart, and we have a lot of ideas for that. On the other hand, I think that both of those kinds of learning are subserved by the caudate nucleus. So I think it's still, even if we don't tease it apart, I think it's still going to be a really useful test for our purpose. But either we're not sure about if we're going to do it in this version or down the road. We do want to tease apart those processes. One thing I'm going to do is include an implicit learning motor memory kind of test um, on the side, so at least we can measure how well patients can do that. But that's, that's something, probably the, one of the biggest things we've been struggling with over the last few months. So dementia does appear in almost all patients with Parkinson's disease before they die. It's a different kind of dementia than Alzheimer's disease. In fact, visual spatial impairment is even more prominent than in Alzheimer's disease. When a patient is showing difficulty on a test of figure copy, it's a bad sign because it, it has been shown that uh, global cognitive decline is on the way. If the patient comes back a year later, they're more likely to be demented. So visual spatial impairment is a really important marker for uh, incipient cognitive decline in Parkinson's disease. Um, so yeah, these patients perform worse on average than Alzheimer's disease on tests of figure copy. They have more trouble with visual attention than auditory attention. When patients with Parkinson's disease have dementia, which is also called dementia with Lewy bodies, they often have hallucinations, visual hallucinations in particular, and they seem to, sh to share a similar neural basis with the visual perceptual problems. So these patients often will see um, ch children or small people or animals frequently um, that aren't there. Are those blue body counts are measurable by imaging, or are those post-mortem? Post-mortem. They're not. Unfortunately, I wish they were measurable by imaging. It would be. It's hard to do imaging studies with Parkinson's disease, actually, because atrophy isn't telling the whole isn't telling as much of the story as it does with Alzheimer's disease. There's a lot of neurochemical abnormalities in Parkinson's and these Lewy bodies which are associated with cognitive impairment. But I should say, actually, I should have put this in my talk perhaps, that we, we do a real comprehensive neuroimaging analysis with all of our patients. And so we're really excited about looking at the relationship between performance on these navigation tests and various neuroimaging indices. So we can see, is, do hippocampal volumes correlate with performance on the allocentric task? And do caudate volumes on the egocentric and we can look at white matter tracks and 
um, also some functional connectivity analyses to look at the different networks that may be involved. This will help us really understand the, uh, the neural bases of performance on our tests. So I'm going to turn now to the last family of diseases, frontotemporal lobar degeneration. So these diseases preferentially impact the frontal lobes here and the most anterior front part, part of the temporal lobe. So not the medial temporal lobe with the hippocampus that we've been talking about in Alzheimer's, more the, the front tip of the temporal lobe. Critical visual spatial processing areas, areas like the um, dorsal and ventral streams in the back of the brain are relatively spared. There are three syndromes in this disease. The most common is the behavioral variant of frontotemporal dementia. These patients typically present in their 50s or 60s, more often men than women, with behavioral problems. Maybe they're making inappropriate lewd comments or they um, have been married to their wife for 30 years but started having an affair with their next door neighbor and couldn't care less how that affects their wife. There's a loss of empathy uh, for what other people think and feel. There's a loss of disgust. They might not see a need to take a shower, or they might um, not see what's wrong with pulling a half junk empty can of Diet Coke out of the garbage and start drinking from it. They might start eating a lot more food than they used to, and particularly sweet foods. They don't really care if it has nutritional value. So these are the kind of symptoms that we see first, and as you can imagine, they typically get referred to psychiatry or just thought to be a bad person. <laughs> rather than getting into CS as quickly as we would like. When there are cognitive problems, they are involving the executive, higher level planning aspects of cognition subserved by the frontal lobes. There are also two language syndromes, progressive non-fluent aphasia and semantic dementia. In progressive non-fluent aphasia, there's, uh, the patients have trouble initiating speech and communicating with language even though they understand language quite well. They just can't get it out. They also can have trouble with writing it as well. Semantic dementia, there's a loss of semantic knowledge. So you might say to a patient, you know, please get me the can opener, and they might look at you with a perplexed face like they've never heard the word can opener before. And even when you hand them the can opener, they don't know what to do with it. They've forgotten what that is. Other forms of memory, like um, where did you go for dinner last night, like that kind of memory, which we see so affected in Alzheimer's disease, is less affected in semantic dementia. So talking about the first of those three syndromes, the behavioral variant of FTD, these patients have predominantly frontal atrophy. It's worse on the right than on the left in this disease, so there is an asymmetry here. Um, and these patients show top-down executive control problems. I'm just going to show you some clinical examples. This is a patient who has no dementia. On the global scale of cognitive function called the MMSE, he scored a perfect score. He's working as a lawyer, traveling around the world, giving talks, um, you know, functionally doing quite well, except for a lot of behavioral problems, which are very upsetting to his wife. And he's doing pretty well in copying this figure. The only, th I wouldn't, if a normal control did this, I wouldn't think anything. But you know, there was some poor planning. He drew this rectangle before he drew the X. And so he had to kind of scoop around there. Nothing to, you know, make a big deal out of, but I think there's a little bit of poor planning there. Here's that same patient. Again, totally, you know, working, driving, doing all this stuff. He's told on this test of design fluency, which is a top-down visual spatial test, he has to create as many different designs as he can using only four lines. Those are the only rules. They all have to have four lines and they all have to be different. He's very concrete in his approach. He only does one type of design. You can imagine there's a lot of different ways to do this. So kind of stuck in set in his thinking. And also he makes a lot of repetition errors. Um, he perseverates. And we're writing up a paper right now that shows that these patients just very frequently make these kinds of errors on this test, and it's associated with their frontal atrophy. Is this the defining diagnostic characteristic here, or is there also imaging representation of the, the, uh, uh, the FTD also at this point? At this point, yeah, we can see something on imaging. 
But really, at this point, what's convincing us the most is that this patient is showing the clinical syndrome of FTD, which is most, uh, we put the most weight on these behavioral symptoms. Um, so saying inappropriate things, lack of empathy, um, you know, I think not uh, putting on a fresh shirt, just feeling what's wrong with wearing the same shirt five days in a row. These behavioral symptoms are what's convincing us the most. However, we could see subtle signs on the brain imaging and these really subtle signs on testing that I'm pointing out. With a test like this, if you gave it to him a week later and said, mm -hmm. or do you see any repeats here? Repeat a pattern, would he say yes or would he say no? That's a good question. Can they notice um, interest? I do remember giving him this test and I s kept prompting him to make every design different. And he said, I am making them all different. <laughs> but um, that's not, so I don't know. I'm not really sure if what he would say. That's a great question. I'm going to try it out with one of the patients. There's no, there's no treatment really for this. Is that accurate? Is there any? There's some symptomatic treatments for FTD. We are, we do have a clinical trial right now that's targeting, targeting the tau protein that aggregates in this disease, um, but there are no uh, disease modifying treatments available right now. Do these diseases occur in combination or is that rare? Well, that's a good question. You know, frequently the Parkinson's dementia and Alzheimer's occur together. In fact, almost all patients who have Lewy body dementia or Parkinson's with dementia have some Alzheimer's pathology in the brain. So those tend to overlap a lot. Um, but uh, FTD occasionally, but not, not more than just by chance, I think. This is a patient with a, so more cognitively impaired than the previous patient. Mild dementia and that global score that was zero to 30, this patient got a 23. This patient had really poor organization. Rather than doing just the box and then the X, sort of a piecemeal approach, drawing the different segments, oversimplifying some of the elements of the design. So this patient, like an Alzheimer's patient, is going to get a bad score in this test, but for a different reason. This is a patient with FTD, but much more severe dementia. This patient was actually mute, couldn't even speak anymore. The disease was so bad. Visual spatial processing from a bottom-up perspective might not be that bad because after all the patient could draw a box and this little X despite being severely, severely demented. But perseverates on this overlearned response of writing her name. By the way, I redrew this figure with a different name to protect the patient's privacy. Um, but every time you put a, a pen in this patient's hand, she can't help uh, but start to write her name. It's an overlearned automatic response coming from the back of the brain and the front of the brain can't inhibit it. So that's getting in the way of her doing visual spatial skills and just about anything she does. This is the test of uh, an, a test of inhibitory spatial attention. We call it the flanker paradigm. In this test, the subject has to indicate the direction of this middle arrow. So here you'd say it's pointing to the right. On some trials, these flanking arrows point in the same direction as the middle arrow, which makes it easier for you to respond. You're quicker. On other trials, they point in the opposite direction, which actually is going to slow you down because that's inhibiting competing information. So even healthy controls are going to be slower when the flanking arrows point in the opposite direction. And this effect is even more striking in FTD. So these are FTDs with no uh, cognitive impairment on traditional tests, so that they're just having behavioral problems but performing pretty well on our gold standard tests. And they're just as fast as the controls on the congruent condition, but when the flanking arrow is pointing in the opposite direction, they show increased slowing. So these patients are having trouble inhibiting a irrelevant information and focusing on what is relevant using their frontal lobes. And lastly, I'm going to talk a little bit about these language variants of FTD. And then, by the way, we're going to have plenty of times for questions or going home early. But uh, anyway, uh, these, these variants have excellent visual spatial skills. Progressive non-fluent aphasia, there's atrophy in the front left part of the brain, 
So remember, the right side of the brain is really important for visual spatial processing. The left is more important for language. And the left front is important for, for language output. So these patients have trouble producing language and communicating, even though they can understand language, because the back part of their brain that understands the language is relatively intact. Semantic dementia, those are the patients who have the loss of semantic information, like what is a can opener. These patients have damaged the anterior temporal lobe, so that lobe that's right here by the ears, the very front part, that part of the brain seems to be critical for uh, uh, remembering semantic information. So these patients, even when their language is so bad that they can't speak or they can't understand what you're saying to them, you put a, a complex figure in front of them, they can copy it just as well as you or I. So the visual spatial uh, processing from the back of the brain is just really good. And even those executive aspects that are affected in the behavioral variant are also pretty good. Why am I talking about them to <laughs> talk about visual spatial cognition? Well, in many of these patients, we see an emergence of artwork. These patients become fascinated with the visual world. In some patients, the art can take on a compulsive quality. They don't want to do anything else. They just want to live in that visual world, that visual experience. In semantic dementia, we do see a sort of a loss of symbolism or abstraction in the art, probably because of the loss of semantic information. But that's not true for the non-fluent variant of FTD. So I'll give you one case example, although we have so many that we see at our clinic. Our clinic is a, one of our specialties is this, this family of disorders. So we've become very interested in this. We had this one patient whose name was Ann Adams who freely shares her name. In fact, you can read all about her on our website. She was a professor of mathematics, so a very left-brained person. Math is really a left-brain task. And midlife, I think it was in her 50s, I believe, her, her son was in an accident and she left work to take care of him. Well, he recovered very quickly and she decided not to go back because she was interested in making art for the first time in her life. And at first the art was quite realistic. But over time it became more abstract and began to take on a transmodal quality. So she liked, for example, to represent musical uh, compositions in visual form. This is one of her paintings. Now, this is of her visual representation of uh, Ravel's Bolero, which you may or may not know. It's, a, it's probably his most uh, well-known piece, and it has a very sort of compulsive, organized, repetitive quality to it. And what she's done is she's come up with all these different rules for how to represent the different phrases in the piece. I forget them offhand, but it's like the height might represent the pitch and the color might represent the duration of the note, for example. So if you, you can actually play this song and follow. We had uh, the person who wrote up this case study did this for us with a pointer, followed along as we listened to Bolero and, and uh, saw the song. Patient can actually verbalize those rules. So it has a conscious semantic understanding of those rules. It's not just something that is retrospectively discovered from the. Yes. Yeah, so she verbalized the rules. So she painted this before the language symptoms began. She painted this uh, just about a year or so before. She said, "I'm mapping pitch to position or whatever." She did. In fact, you can. Uh, yeah, I can um, show you anyone the manuscript if you're interested. I was. I I just read it recently, and she had laid it all out very clearly. She also liked to represent abstract concepts in visual form. For example, the number pi she represented in visual form. Um, so this sort of transmodal crossing concepts aspect became very fascinating to her. As the disease, bega the disease began and she started to lose her ability to express herself. She had that non-fluent form of aphasia affecting the front part of her brain. And she just became more immersed in the visual world, having more and more success as an artist. So wh why? Uh -huh. the, the emergence of that fascination, is that, I mean, that uh, it's not really a development of new abilities. Is there an understanding of why? Is that, this is a distant analogy, maybe, it'd be, is that anatomically related to sort of motor representations taking over motor regions in amputees, that kind of thing, where it's literally an adaptation to, to the lack of function in certain areas that it, but it's happening in front of the cortex, so it manifests as a fascination. Is there an understanding of why you, why, where that fascination comes from? Why that would happen. So there's a few 
there's three major theories I can think of about why this might happen. Um, one is that these patients can't use their language, but they can use their visual spatial skills. That's an intact area for them. That part of the brain is still working. So they spend time there because they can use those skills. And just by practice alone, they get better and they get more enjoyment out of it because it's something they can do, whereas language is frustrating. Yes? This is a mirror image of the old uh, tradition of the blind poet. The blind poet, and yes. Homer, who allegedly could not see, so he had poetry. Exactly, exactly. So maybe they just, they do what they can do. It sounds like it has a little bit more, make her if I'm wrong, it sounds like it has a little bit more of a, of a, compulsive, a pathologically compulsive quality than just like yeah. a, I discovered a new thing that's fun for me. Yeah. Yes, and I think most people in our group would agree with you. And the reason that, so our people that I work with, um, their theory is that parts of your brain are always inhibiting other parts of your brain. The left hemisphere is inhibiting the right, the right's inhibiting the left. The front's inhibiting the back, the back's inhibiting the front. If you get select cell death in the left front of your brain, you're releasing the functions of the back right part of your brain. And interestingly, if you look at her MRI scan, the right back of her brain is actually bigger than the right back of the brain of control subjects. And if you look at perfusion, so um, you know, you, using uh, sugars in the brain, that part of the brain is using more. There's hyperperfusion compared to controls. So, um, so that's another theory, and I think that's a theory that um, the person who, would, who wrote this paper would probably ascribe to, but it's very controversial. There are some other people who disagree and think, well, there's actually some mild distortions that are interesting to us viewers, and that's just because of the brain damage. So these interesting distortions or creativity in the work weren't really done for effect. They're just a, a symptom of the brain damage. I can't remember it's called. There's some people who have uh, hallucinations when they hear music. I can't remember the name of it. Is, would, oh, synesthesia. Yeah, did she report uh, similar? She did not have synesthesia, but that's an excellent question because it, it kind of seems like maybe colors she did based on this. Yeah. She was assigning colors to mean something related to sound, but she, she was asked that and she didn't report that symptom. There was one interesting twist to this story. So she became just obsessed with Maurice Ravel who wrote this musical piece, but did not know that Maurice Ravel actually had the same exact disease. So around the time that he created this song, he was in the earliest stages of the same kind of language uh, dementia that this woman had and similarly became sort of obsessed with order and organization in a compulsive way, which I think is reflected in this song that she became fascinated with. So in summary, we talked about three, the three most common causes of neurodegenerative disease today and focused on their visual spatial cognition. In Alzheimer's disease, we see dysfunction of both where and what processing, that's the dorsal and ventral stream processing. And we hypothesize that early on in the disease, they might have a problem with allocentric navigation because of the medial temporal lobe atrophy. In Parkinson's disease, we see more dorsal or uh, location-based processing than we do object-based processing, specifically affecting aspects of attention and working memory. And we hypothesize that they may have more egocentric impairment early on because of the dysfunction involving the caudate nucleus and its circuits with the frontal and parietal lobes. In Parkinson's disease with dementia, the visual spatial problems are more prominent and widespread than in Parkinson's disease without dementia. In front of temporal lobar degeneration, there's the three variants. In the behavioral variant, they have trouble with the executive or top-down aspects of visual cognition. And the language variants have excellent visual spatial cognition um, and, the, and severe language dysfunction. If you want to learn more about what we do at our group, I encourage you to take a look at our website. And also we have a channel on YouTube where we have a lot of videos of some of our faculty talking about these diseases and we have some, uh, I think we also have some uh, videos of our patients showing
some of the symptoms. We don't have too many visual spatial videos yet. I'm actually working on that. I want to show some uh, videos of what these different visual spatial impairments look like. We have a lot of videos of those behavioral impairments that you see a lot in FTD on this site. So anyway, it's been a real honor to get to share what I've been working out about with, uh, with all of you. Uh, I don't know exactly where I'd be right now with my research if I hadn't been so lucky as to form this collaboration with your group. And I think that this collaboration is representing a possible new path to where neuropsychology can go five and ten years down the road. So thank you for that opportunity. Yeah? You, you mentioned briefly that there's, um, there are effects of practicing mental exercise on capital development and we sort of hear all the time about how education and mental engagement can delay the onset of dementia. Do you think that the, the virtual environments you're talking about so far have been purely diagnostic. Do you think those effects are actually robust enough that, in principle, you could, uh, as a treatment, have somebody work in a virtual environment for an hour or two hours a day or whatever and measurably slow the onset of Alzheimer's or Parkinson's? That's a very tough question um, and definitely controversial. There are a number of companies out there right now that are making money by selling cognitive exercise products to patients who have Alzheimer's disease. And I think in general, the research with those kinds of, uh, those kinds of um, puzzles and things don't show that they necessarily help more than just engaging the brain. So we encourage our patients to, to use their brain, but to use it in a way that's fun for them. Maybe, but it's hard to know if at that point it's really going to help to selectively use your hippocampus over and over again. But the research with the taxi drivers suggests it, it's a question, I don't know if it's been directly answered. I wonder if those taxi drivers are going to be less likely to get Alzheimer's disease. Or let's you know, project 10 years forward to when we have really reliable genetic markers so that really pre-onset you can reliably pre predict the eventual onset of Alzheimer's and Parkinson's and then it might be then it's not maybe too late to actually select the way exercise you have on campus if you can predict that that's expected to generate. If I were in that situation, I would do it. Yeah, we don't have the data to support it, but I think there's reason. Every day, every day. Yeah, yeah, right. I'd throw out MapQuest and force myself to learn where things are and, and yeah, generate a cognitive map. Or just get a second job as a taxi driver. Thing. Or, yeah, exactly. <laughs> And we're, you know, that's not that far off either. There's new imaging techniques where we can actually image the uh, amyloid deposition that we see in Alzheimer's disease. So we can see the pathological proteins now in vivo. We also have cerebral spinal fluid tests where we can measure these uh, proteins. So for Alzheimer's disease, we're pretty good, I think. We don't use these tests clinically, but we use them in our research. So we, we're pretty good at determining who is going to get Alzheimer's and who isn't with these tests. We think. We're still researching them. Keep asking questions. If no one else has a question. Are there? Uh, so you've also talked about late onset, only late onset diseases. Are there congenital diseases that happen in children or in adolescents that have similar manifestations that this type of diagnostic test could apply to? Also, I've never heard of any. I just yeah, I just that's a great a question. Um, it, I'll have to be honest. It's not my area of specialty, but it's. It's very likely, I'm thinking like fetal alcohol syndrome. I know they have a lot of subcortical problems, but yeah, um, certainly it could be useful for other diseases where these brain areas are important. It's often seizures, disorders involve the medial temporal lobe. Yeah. Although some of these diseases can start earlier than you think. I had a patient last week who was in his late 30s, a professional football player. Because of all of the head injuries, the concussions he'd had, he's coming down with an early onset form of Alzheimer's disease in his late 30s. Is that? Uh, it's uh, pathologically similar, Alzheimer's, in cases where it was actually induced by injury. Is, you'd still diagnose it as the same kind of Alzheimer's? That it's not exactly <laughs> the same. It's, it is a little but bit it's different. Funny if it, I sort of yeah. think of Alzheimer's as having a, either a genetic or a chemical origin. It'd be sort of yeah. Seems like astonishing research wise if, if it could actually manifest similarly based on external injury. Yes, it, it um, shares some features, like it has this pathological tau protein that we see in Alzheimer's, but it doesn't have as much of the amyloid. It has a slower progression, often has Parkinsonian features. Muhammad Ali may have this type of disease. 
Well, thank you all. And I'm going to be here all day tomorrow, too. And I'd be m most pleased to have discussions with any of you and, or to have you come on by and try out one of our tests.